I coined my own definition of success in 1934 when I was teaching at a high school in South Bend, Indiana, being a little bit uh, uh, disappointed and delusioned perhaps by the way parents of the youngsters in my English classes uh, expected their youngsters to, to uh, get an A or B. They thought a C was all right for the neighbor's children because the neighbor's children are all average. But they weren't satisfied with their own and would make the teacher feel that they had uh, uh, failed or the youngster had failed. And, and that's not right. The good Lord in his infinite wisdom didn't create us all equal as far as intelligence concerned, any more than we equal as far as size, appearance. Not everybody could earn an A or B. And I didn't like that way of judging. And, and I did know how the alumni of various uh, schools back in the 30s judged coaches and athletic teams. Uh, if you won them all, you were considered to be reasonably successful. Not completely, because I found out uh, we had a number of years at UCLA where we didn't lose a game, but it seemed that we didn't win each individual game by the margin that some of our alumni had predicted, and quite frequently I, <laughs> quite frequently I, I really felt that they had backed up their predictions in a more materialistic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, manner. But I was true back in the 30s, so I understood that. So I, but I didn't like it. I didn't agree with it. And I wanted to come up with something that I hope could make me a better teacher and give the youngsters under my supervision, whether it be in athletics or in the English classroom, something to which to aspire other than just uh, a higher mark in the classroom or more points in some athletic contest. And I thought about that for quite a spell. And I wanted to come up with my own definition. I thought that might help. And uh, I knew how Mr. Webster defined it as the accumulation of material possessions or the attainment of position of power or prestige or something of that sort were the accomplishments perhaps, but in my opinion, not necessarily indicative of success. So I wanted to come up with something of my own. And I recalled, uh, I was raised on a small farm in Southern Indiana and dad tried to teach me and my brothers that you should never try to be better than someone else. I'm sure at the time uh, he did that, I didn't, it didn't, well, somewhere, I guess, in the hidden recesses of the mind, it popped out years later. Never try to be better than someone else. Always learn from others. And never cease trying to be the best you could be. That's under your control. And if you get too engrossed and involved and concerned in regard to the things over which you have no control, it will adversely affect the things over which you have control. Then I ran across a simple verse that said, At God's footstool to confess, a poor soul knelt and bowed his head. I failed, he cried. The master said, thou didst thy best. That is success. From those things and one other perhaps, I coined my own definition of success, which is peace of mind attained only through self-satisfaction and knowing you made the effort to do the best of which you're capable. I believe that's true. If you make the effort to do the best of which you're capable, trying to improve the situation that exists for you, I think that's success and I don't think others can judge that. I think it's like character and reputation. Your reputation is what you're perceived to be. Your character is what you really are. And I think the character is uh, much more important than what you are perceived to be. You'd hope they'd both be good, but uh, they don't necessarily be the same. Well, that was my idea of what I was going to try to get across to the youngsters. I ran across other things. I, I love to teach, and it was mentioned uh, by the previous uh, uh, speaker that, that uh, I enjoy poetry and I dabble in it a bit and love it. And there are some things that help me, I think, be better than I would have been. I know I'm not what I ought to be and not what I should be, but I, I think I'm better than I would have been if I hadn't run across certain things. And one was just a little verse that said, uh, um, no, no written word, no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books on all the shelves is what the teachers are themselves. That made an impression on me in the, in the, in the 1930s. And, and uh, I tried to use that uh, more or less in my teaching, whether it be in sports or whether it be in the English classroom. And I, 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 I love poetry and always had an interest in that. And somehow, and I, maybe it's because dad and used to read uh, to us at night in the coal oil lamp. We didn't have electricity uh, in our farm home. And, they had to read poetry to us, so I always liked it. And about the same time that I ran across this one verse, I ran across another one that someone asked a, a lady teacher why she taught. And she, uh, after some time, she said she wanted to think about that. And then she came up and said, uh, they ask me why I teach and I reply, where could I find such splendid company? 
There sits a statesman, strong, unbiased, wise, and another later Webster, silver-tongued. A doctor sits beside him whose quick, steady hand may mend a bone or stem the lifeblood's flow. And there a builder, upward rise the arch of that church he builds, wherein that minister may speak the word of God and lead a stumbling soul to touch the Christ. And all about a gathering of teachers, farmers, merchants, laborers, those who work and vote and build and plan and pray, and pray into a great tomorrow. And I may say, I may not see the church or hear the word or eat the food their hands may grow, but yet again I may. And later I may say, I knew him once, and he was weak or strong or bold or proud or gay. I knew him once, but then he was a boy. They ask me why I teach, and I reply, where could I find such splendid company? And I believe the teaching profession, that's true, you have so many youngsters, and I got to think of my youngsters at UCLA, 30-some attorneys, 11 uh, uh, dentists, 10 doctors, uh, many, many teachers in, in, in other professions. And that, that uh, gives you a, a great deal of pleasure to see them go on. I, I always tried to make the youngsters feel that they're there to get an education, number one, basketball was second, because they're paying their way. And they do need a little time for social activities, but you let social activities take a little precedence over the other two, and you're not going to have any uh, very long. So that was the idea is that I, I tried to, uh, to get across uh, uh, to the youngsters under my supervision. I had three rules, pretty much, that I stuck with practically all the time. I'd learned these prior to coming to UCLA, and I decided they were very important. One was never be late. Never be late. Um, uh, later on, I had, I had certain things that I had. The players, if we're leaving for someone, they had to be neat and clean. There was a, night, a time when I, I made them wear uh, um, uh, jackets and shirts and ties. But, and then I saw our chancellor coming to school in, Long in the denims and, and turtlenecks, and I thought it was a little not right for me to keep this other, so I let them just, they had to be neat and clean. And I had one of my, uh, one of my greatest players that you probably heard of, Bill Walton. He came and, uh, and gets the bus, we were leaving for somewhere and to play, and he wasn't clean and neat, so I, I would let him go. He couldn't get on the bus, he had to go home and, and, and get cleaned up to get to the airport if he did. So I, I was a stickler for that, I believed in that. I believe in time, very important. I believe you should be on time, but I felt a practice, for example, we start on time, we close on time. The youngsters didn't have to feel that we're going to keep them over. When I speak at coaching clinics, I often tell young coaches, and the coaching clinics, more, than, more or less, they'll be the younger coaches uh, getting in the, in the profession, and, and most of them are young, you know, and, and probably newly married, and I tell them, don't run practices uh, late because you'll go home in a bad mood. And, and that's not good for a young married man to go home in a bad mood. When you get older, when you get older, it doesn't make any difference, but... Uh, <laughs> so I did believe on time. I believe starting on time, and I believe closing on time. And another one I had was not one word of profanity. One word of profanity, and you, you are out of here for the day. If I see it in a game, you're going to come out and sit on the bench. And the third one was uh, never criticize a teammate. I, I didn't want that. I used to tell them I was paid to do that. That's my job. I'm paid to do it. Pitifully poor, but I am paid to do it. Not like the coaches today, for gracious sakes, no. Uh, they're, they're, it's, it's a little different than it, than it was in my day. But those are the three things that I uh, stuck with uh, pretty closely all the time. And uh, uh, those actually came from my dad. And that's what he tried to uh, teach me and uh, my uh, brothers at one time. I came up with a, a pyramid eventually that I'm not going to, we don't have the time to go on that, but uh, that to help me, I think, become a better teacher. And uh, this is it's something like this, and I had blocks in the pyramid, and uh, the cornerstones being industrious and enthusiasm, working hard and enjoying what you're doing, coming up to the apex, uh, according to my definition of success, and right at the top, faith and patience. And I say to you, in whatever you're doing, you must be patient. We have to have patience to, uh, we want things to happen to us. We talk about our youth being impatient a lot, and they are. Uh, they won't change everything. They think all change is progress. And we get a little older, we sort of let things go, and we forget that there is no progress without change. So you must have patience, and I believe that we must have faith. I believe that we must believe, really believe, not just, not just give a word service, believe that things will work out as they should, providing we do what we should. I think our tendency is to hope that things will turn out the way we want them to so much of the time, but we don't do the things that uh, are necessary to make those things uh, 
become reality. Uh, I worked on this for some 14 years and I, I think it helped me become a better teacher, but it all evolved around that original definition of success. You know, a, a number of years ago, there was a Major League Baseball umpire by the name of George Moriarty, and he spelled Moriarty with only one I. That's that, I'd never seen that before, but he did. And big league baseball players, they're, they're very perceptive about those things, and they noticed he had only one I in his name. And you'd, you'd be surprised how many also told him that that was one more than he had in his head at various times. <laughs> But he wrote something that I think he did what I tried to do in this pyramid. He called it the road ahead or the road behind. And he said, sometimes I think the fates must grin as we denounce them and insist the only reason we can't win is the fates themselves have missed. Yet there lives on the ancient claim we win or lose within ourselves. The shining trophies on our shelves can never win tomorrow's game. You and I know deeper down there's always a chance to win the crown, but when we fail to give our best, we simply haven't met the test of giving all and saving none until the game is really won. Of showing what is meant by grit, of playing through and others quit, of playing through not letting up, it's bearing down that wins the cup, of dreaming there's a goal ahead, of hoping when our dreams are dead, of praying when our hopes have fled, yet losing, not afraid to fall, if bravely we have given all, for who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? Giving all, it seems to me, is not so far from victory. And so the fates are seldom wrong, no matter how they twist and wind, it's you and I who make our fates. We open up or close the gates on the road ahead near the road behind. Reminds me of another set of threes that my dad tried to get across to us. Don't whine, don't complain, don't make excuses. You get out there and whatever you're doing, do it to the best of your ability. And no one can do more than that. Um, I tried to get across to that. My punishment will tell you, never heard me mention winning. Never mention winning. My idea is that you can lose when you outscore somebody in a game, and you can win when you're outscored. I've felt that way on certain occasions at various times. And I, w I just wanted to be able to be able to hold their head up after a game. I used to say that when, when a game is over and you see somebody that didn't know the outcome, I hope they couldn't tell by your actions uh, whether you outscored an opponent or the op opponent outscored you. Um, uh, and th that's what really matters. If you make your effort to do the best you can regularly, uh, the results will be about what they should be. Not necessarily what you'd want them to be, but they'll be about what they should. And only you will know whether you can do that. And that's what I wanted from them uh, uh, more than anything else. And as time went by and I learned more about other things, I, I think it worked a little better uh, as far as the results. But I wanted the, the score of a game to be the uh, byproduct uh, of these other things, and, and not the end itself. I believe it was um, uh, mm -hmm. one great philosopher said, uh, no, no, uh, Cervantes. Cervantes said, the journey is better than the end. And, and, and I like that. I, I think that is, it, it's getting there. Sometimes when you get there, there's almost a letdown, but it's getting there that's the fun. I like to, as a basketball coach at UCLA, I liked our practices to be the journey and the, the game would, would be the end, the end result. And I'd like to go up and sit in the stands and, and watch the players play and see whether I'd done a decent job uh, during the week. I, and there again, it, it's getting the players to get that self-satisfaction knowing that they've made the effort to do the best of, of, of which uh, uh, they are capable. Um, sometimes I'm asked uh, who, who is uh, the best player I had over the best teams, I, I can never answer that. Uh, uh, as far as the individual is concerned, I, I like to, uh, I was asked one time uh, about that, and it, it said, uh, suppose that you in some way could, could, could make the perfect player, what would you want? And I said, well, I'd want one that knew why he was at UCLA and to get an education, that was a good student, uh, really knew why he was there in the first place. But I want one that could play, too. I'd want one to realize that uh, that defense usually wins championships and will work hard on defense. And, but I, I, I'd want one to play offense too. I want him to be unselfish and, and, and look for the pass first and not shoot all the time. And um, I'd want one that could pass and would pass. I've had, some that, <laughs> I've had some that could and wouldn't, and I've had some that would and could. You, sure, you, you, you couldn't, so you, you're trying so, um, I wanted that, and I, I wanted him to be able to shoot from the outside. And I wanted to be able to be good inside too. 
<laughs> I, 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 I'd want them to be able to be able to rebound well at both ends too. And why not just take someone like uh, Keith Wilkes and let it go at that? He, he had the qualifications and not the only one, but he was one that I used in that uh, particular category because I think he, he made the effort to become the best. There's a couple. I mentioned in my book, they call me coach, uh, that uh, uh, two players that gave me great satisfaction and it came as close as I think anyone I ever had to reach their full potential. One was Conrad Burke and one was Doug McIntosh. When I saw them, as freshmen on our freshman team, we didn't have freshmen, couldn't play varsity when I, I taught. And uh, I thought, oh gracious, if these two players, either one of them, they're different years, but I thought about each one of them at the time he was there. Oh, if he ever makes the bar varsity, our varsity must be pretty miserable if he's good, to make, good enough to make it. And you know, one of them uh, was a starting uh, player for uh, a season and a half, and the other one was a uh, his next year, he played uh, 32 minutes in a national championship game, did a tremendous for us. And the next year, he was a starting, a starting player on the national championship team. And here, I, I, I thought he'd never play a minute when it was. Uh, so those are the things that, that give you uh, a great joy and great satisfaction to see one. Neither one of those youngsters could shoot very well, but they had outstanding shooting percentages because they didn't, didn't force it. And neither one could uh, jump very well, but they get, kept good position, and so they did well rebounding. They remembered that, uh, that every shot is taken, they assumed it'd be missed. I've had two men that stand around, wait to see if it's missed, then they go and shoot late. Somebody else is in there ahead of them. Uh, and and uh, they, they weren't very quick, but they played good position, kept in good balance. And, and so they, they played pretty good defense for us. So they had qualities that they came close to, uh, as close to reaching possibly their full potential as um, any players I ever had. So I consider them as to be as successful as a, as a Lewis Alcindor or a Bill Walton or a, in many of the others that we had. There were some outstanding, uh, outstanding um, uh, uh, players. I, have I rambled enough? <laughs> I, I, I was heard that when he makes his appearance, I was supposed to shut up. <laughs> <laughs>